the battle of Badr, Abu Jahl in the battlefield. One of the people of Quraysh, they looked at Abu Jahl and they said, Abu Jahl, do you think Muhammad was, is lying? And he said, no. Look what he said after that. He said, he is not one to lie about Allah when he didn't lie about our normal day-to-day -day life conversations. If we trusted him with our person and he never lied to us about day-to-day -day things and the dealings and everything, how is he going to lie Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about Allah Azza wa Jalla? وأقول قال الله جل جلاله والمصطفى الهادي ولا أتأول الحمد لله رب العالمين له الحمد الحسن والثناء الجميل وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له يقول الحق وهو يهدي السبيل وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين لهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد we are in the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam um, In today's insha'Allah Ta'ala session I'm going to speak about how Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala Protected Nabi Allah Muhammad From Min Adrani Al Jahiliya The impurities Of Jahiliya Meaning before Islam Allah subhanahu what they used to practice The bad things that they used to practice Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala He saved the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam from that He was protected Even before he became a prophet Al-Jahiliyyah Is referred to before Nabi Allah Muhammad became a prophet Are we all together? But to refer to the Muslims today as a time of Jahiliyyah, the scholars, they say this is dangerous. Because this could mean, or it could mean, ta'amim al-kufr. But you're saying Muslims are all disbelievers now. Al-Jahiliyyah, okay, meant the period before Nabi Allah Muhammad came and the people were disbelievers. The bulk of the people were disbelievers. Okay. It was few people who were upon Tawheed. After Nabi Allah Muhammad came, we don't refer to it as the time of Jahiliya. We should not say that. So before Nabi Allah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came out, he was a protected person. Allah was protecting him Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And he had a very good biography. His seerah was amazing, alayhi salatu wasalam. He wasn't actually known for the weaknesses of humans that they fell into. He wasn't known to have that, alayhi salatu wasalam. He was seen by them as the trustworthy one. They knew him, the title they gave to him voluntarily from themselves was Al-Ameen. That's what they referred to him. They used to call him Al Amin. Look what Hafiz Ibn Kathir said, Rahimahullah. Ibn Kathir, he said, Ibn Kathir is one of the great scholars of Al Islam. He has the Tafsir book. We hear it. Tafsir Ibn Kathir, right? He also has, Ibn Kathir, he has a book called Al Bidaya to Wal Nihaya. And that book, Al Bidaya Wal Nihaya, Ibn Kathir talks about the beginning of the creation and, and he talks about until the end when everything's over of course the author passed away and he died so then there's a period between his time to our time that's missing right so someone can carry on inshallah and finish it off and then after our time, until whatever time it becomes, somebody else should add on to it. But that book is a, is a backbone when it comes to Islamic history. Ibn Kathir's kitab, Al-Bidaya wa Nihaya, if you want to study the Islamic history, what had happened, Ibn Kathir has a very scholarly way of writing things. So this is who he is, and he's the student of Ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn Kathir is a what? He's a student of Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah. He says 
about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam He says when he was doing the ayah Alam naj- alam yajidka, alam najidka, alam yajidka yatiman fa'awa When Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala said, did we not find you an orphan Muhammad and we cared for you fa'awa mean we protected you, we took you in shelter He says, Ibn Kathir ثم قال الله تعالى يعدد نعمه على عبده ورسوله محمد Allah is mentioning his blessings that he has bestowed upon our messenger صلوات الله وسلامه عليه وذلك أن the blessings are أن أباه توفي that the prophet's father passed away وهو حمل في بطن أمه أن the messenger was in the womb of his mother. ثم توفيت أمه and then his mother got taken. آمين بنت وهب وله من العمر ست وله من العمر ست سنين. How old was the Prophet when, the, when his mother passed away? Six years of age. ثم كان and the messenger was then after that في كفالة جده عبد المطلب. He was then under the shelter of في كفالة جده عبد المطلب إلى أن توفي until عبد المطلب passed away وله من العمر and the messenger was how old when his granddad passed away yeah وله من العمر ثمان سنين he was eight years of age فكف فكفله عمه أبو طالب his uncle أبو طالب took over. ثُمَّ لَمْ يَزَلْ يَحُوطُهُ وَيَنْصُرُهُ His uncle was taking care of him and protecting him. وَيَرْفَعُ مِنْ قَدْرِهِ وَيُوَقِّرُهُ He was raising him, honoring him, صلى الله عليه وسلم. وَيَكُفُ عَنْهُ أَذَا قَوْمِهِ بَعْدَ عَنْ بَعْدَ أَنِ ابْتَعَثَهُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى عَلَى رَأْسِ أَرْبَعِينَ سَنَةً مِنْ عُمْرِهِ Until the age of 40, his uncle was taking care of him. And then Allah sent him out as a prophet. هذا وأبو طالب على دين قومه من عبادة الأوثان. أبو طالب was still upon the religion of idol worshiping. He didn't change his religion, but he was taking care of the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام. وكل ذلك بقدر الله وحسن تدبيره. Now, there's a wisdom why Abu Talib stayed as a non-Muslim in order to be able to protect the Prophet. Some of the scholars mention if Abu Talib took Islam. He wouldn't be able to stop Quraysh from the Prophet ﷺ. Everything Allah does is there's a wisdom behind it. Abu Talib was able to convince them, leave the Prophet ﷺ. Don't touch him, don't do anything to him because he is one of them. Abu Talib is one of Quraysh. He's upon the religion of Quraysh. He hasn't let down Quraysh. But he's also related to the Prophet so he can protect him. Ibn Kathir says all of this Allah was doing it with wisdom he knows. And today this is missing from us, a lot of us, right? To know that everything Allah does, there's a what? A wisdom behind it, right? Are we all together? I was pondering the other day on the story of Musa alayhi salam. When Musa alayhi uh, salam, his mother gave birth, she was hiding it from Fir'aun, right? And she was scared that if Fir'aun's soldiers come to her house and they see Musa alayhi salam, they may take him, and then when they take him, what are they going to do? They're going to harm him. But Allah wanted to show her something very profound and very amazing. Allah wanted to show his ability to her. Allah says, وَأُوحَيْنَا إِلَىٰ أُمِّ مُوسَىٰ أَنْ أَرْضِعِيهِ فَإِذَا خِفْتِ عَلَيْهِ فَأَلْقِيهِ فِي الْيَمِّ وَلَا تَخَافِ وَلَا تَحْزَنِي إِنَّا رَادُوهُ إِلَيْكِ وَجَاعِلُهُ مِنَ الْمُرْسَلِينَ Allah said, don't worry, let Musa go, place him in the sea, let him go, we will return him back to you. We're not just going to return him back as an ordinary person, he's going to return back as a messenger. She was running away, ponder here. She's running away from Fir'aun. And what does Allah do? At the time that she's putting him into the ocean and she's doing all of this, she's trying to protect him from Fir'aun and all of that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to show his ability. He takes him to the house of Fir'aun. And who raises him? Yeah? 
Fir'aun himself raises the uh, Nabi Lahim Musa alayhi sah? Brothers, this, all that is shocking. It's profound. But then what amazed me even more was the mother of Musa was poor. She didn't have much. Musa came back to her and she was paid to breastfeed her child. Sah? And Musa came back to her because Musa, when Asiya, the wife of Fir'aun, she brought somebody to breastfeed Musa. And then Musa wouldn't take anyone's breast milk. Her sister, his sister, sorry, Musa's sister, she went to Asiya and said, I, I might know someone who can breastfeed him. She knows he's her brother. And I'm taking to his mom. But she won't say his mom. They're still scared, they're worried. So Allah Taala willed that she takes her brother to his mom and she watches her son, sees him. She's taken care of now financially, they take care of her now, they feed, because he, he now calmed down. This is how Allah Taala does things. If we trust him and we believe in him, Allah will take care of everything for us subhanahu wa ta'ala. إِلَىٰ أَن تُوفِي أَبُوْ طَالِبٍ قَبْلَ الْهِجْرَةِ بِقَلِيلٍ Abu Talib, he passed away just before the Hijrah, a little bit before it. فَأَقْدَمَ عَلَيْهِ سُفَهَاءُ قُرَيْشٍ وَجُهَالُهُمْ The ignorant ones from Quraysh and the dim-witted ones, they tried to harm the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام. فَاخْتَارَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى لَهُ الْهِجْرَةِ مِنْ بَيْنِ أَظْهُرِهِمْ إِلَىٰ بَلَدِ الْأَنصَارِ مِنَ الْأَوْسِ وَالْخَزْرَجِ And the Prophet ﷺ, Allah wanted him to leave Mecca, go to Medina, Gonna, there's people that are going to take, take care of you over there. So the Prophet left Mecca and he went to Medina alayhi salatu wasalam. Now, the people of Medina, the two main tribes, Al-Aws and Al-Khazraj, he stays with them. They, they take care of him. كَمَا أَجَرَ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى سُنَّتَهُ عَلَى الْوَجْهِ الْأَتَمِّ وَالْأَكْمَلِ فَلَمَّا وَصَلَ إِلَيْهِ آوَوْهُ وَنَصَرُوهُ وَحَاطُوهُ وَقَاتَلُوا بَيْنَ يَدَيْهِ رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُمْ أَجْمَعِينَ وَكُلُّ هَذَا مِنْ حِفْظِ اللَّهِ تَعَالَى لَهُ وَكَلَاءَتِهِ وَعِنَايَتِهِ بِهِ When he came to Medina, Aws and Khazraj, what did they say to him? What was the Pledge of Allegiance? The Pledge of Allegiance was on the grounds and it was on the promise that we will take care of you the way that we take care of our women and our children. And did Aws and Khazraj do that? Until he died, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they took care of him. He then, what I, the reason I read the kalam of Ibn Kathir was what? The Prophet was always cared for and protected by Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala, All his life. From the day his mother died, his father died before that, his uncle, granddad died, his uncle, he was taken care of, he was protected. Allah protected him Subh'anaHu Wa Taala. The ways that Allah protected him, number one, is that the Prophet والسلام, he didn't like the idols. He did not like idols, والسلام, who he hated it. In other words, he grew upon a tawheed and al aqidah. He, his belief in his heart and his aqidah was clean. He didn't like idol worshipping. His iman was very strong. He was a person who think and pondered and contemplated a lot. He didn't accept the society, what they were looking up to, the idols. He didn't like that. It's narrated that the Prophet ﷺ spoke to Khadija bint Khuwailid, his wife. The Prophet said to her, he said, Ay Khadija, Khadija, Wallahi la a'budu allat. Khadija, I am never going to worship allat. Wallahi la a'budu al-uzza abadan. This is before he became a prophet. The age of 25. He said, I'm never going to worship allat and al-uzza. Never. What did Khadija say to him? She said to him, Khalli allat wa al-uzza. Leave allat and al-uzza, ignore it. And Imam Ahmad narrated that in his musnad. A monk 
in the travels that the Prophet used to do to Sham, one of the monks asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about Allat and Al-Uzza. He said to him, As'aluka billati wal-Uzza. Meaning, I'm going to ask you through Allah to Al-Uzza. Not, I'm going to ask you by Allah. He said, I'm going to ask you through Allah to Al-Uzza. He said this to the Prophet. The Prophet then said to him, لا تسألني بحق الله والعزة Do not ask me through Allah and Al-Uzza. فوالله by Allah ما أبغضت شيئا قط بغضي لهما There is nothing I hate more than that. And I hate someone swearing to me through a lot of uzza. يعني شرك he didn't like it عليه عليه الصلاة والسلام. Also, before he became a prophet, the prophet one day was doing tawaf around the Kaaba. Okay, tawaf around the Kaaba. And tawaf around the Kaaba was the practice of who? Nabi Allah Ibrahim عليه السلام. So they used to practice tawaf around the Kaaba. The Prophet was doing it sallallahu, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And with him was Zayd. And so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was going around the Kaaba, and at that time there were two idols in the Kaaba. Isafun and Naila. Isaf and Naila, they, the story they mentioned for it was that they did zina in front of the Kaaba and Allah turned them into stones. That's what they say. There were two people, a girl and a, a man and a woman. Naila was the woman and Isaf was the man. They committed zina in front of the Kaaba. And some other scholars, they said, no, he just kissed her in front of the Kaaba. And Allah turned them both into what? Into stones. Anyways, they used to worship them. They used to what? Worship them. So Zayd said, the, the, they would do a tawaf around the Kaaba and they would go to the idols and they would touch the idols. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said to Zayd, La tamassahu. Do not touch the idols. Do tawaf but don't touch the idols. Then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, him carried on doing it and then he did it another time. And then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to him, this is before he became a prophet, he said to him, La tamassahu. Don't touch it. Alam tunha, were you not told to not do it? And did I not tell you to leave it? So the Prophet ﷺ, he left it. Well, Zaydin, look what he said. He said, فَوَالَّذِي أَكْرَمَهُ وَأَنزَلَ عَلَيْهِ الْكِتَابَ مَسْتَلَمَ صَلَمًا قَطُّ حَتَّى أَكْرَمَهُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى بِالَّذِي أَكْرَمَهُ وَأَنزَلَ عَلَيْهِ and he never did he, as sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ever touch an idol. It was pure and his tawheed was clean. Also, the second thing that the Prophet sallam, he didn't like to do was poetry. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, didn't like poetry. He would not like to يعني, make poetry and construct poetry. He hated it. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Uh, Imam Ahmed narrates in his Musnad and this author Hakim brings it in his Al-Mustadrak and he says وَهُوَ عَلَى شَرْطِ الشَّيْخَيْنِ He says it's a condition of Bukhari and Muslim uh, that Aisha رضي الله تعالى عنها the wife of the Prophet she asked the Prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام she said she didn't ask the Prophet she actually spoke about the Prophet she was, first of all, somebody asked her the question, هَلْ كَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمَ يُتَسَامَحُ عِنْدَهُ الشِّعْرُ with the, in the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم, would he allow poetry? And she said, كَانَ أَبْغَضَ الْحَدِيثِ إِلَيْهِ He hated poetry. Now, we have to understand this deeply. He hated it from him saying it himself. He hated it. Salawatullahi wa And there's a reason why. It's because the Quran is not poetry. If the Prophet was a poet, they would have listed him as one of the poets. They would have said he's Imru Qais and Antara and Zuhair ibn Abi Sulma and all the poets that have come before who spoke poetry and eloquence. They would have added him to that list. Alayhi salatu wasalam. He wasn't a poet. And he never constructed a poetry from himself. 
Allah says it in the Quran Allah said we didn't teach him poetry and it is not befitting for him poetry the reason why Allah then says is because if you look at the poets the poets their poetry was not befitting for the character of a noble person they were very bad in their manners and the things that they will talk about if you look at the poetry before Islam like Murul Qais he speaks about alcohol women the majority of poetry it starts with what is called al ghazal or at tashbib first of all they have to talk about a woman kifa nabki min dhikra habibin wa manzilin بسقط اللواء بين الدخول فحملي فتوضح فالمقرات يعني he's talking about a woman he loves and her buildings and how he and he goes into Ibn Qais actually he's the worst when it comes to poetry he's vulgar very vulgar the same with كعب بن الزهير بانت سعاد فقلب اليوم متبول متيم إثرها لم يفت مكبول وما سعاد غداة البين إذ رحلوا إلا أغن غطيط طرف مكحول حيفاء مقبلة عجزاء مدبرة لا يشتكى منها قصر ولا طول He describes her when she, when she walks away how she looks when she walks towards him how she looks her height, her length Who talks about that stuff? The vulgar, their speech So Allah is saying وَمَا عَلَّمْنَاهُ الشِّعْرَ وَمَا يَنْبَغِي لَهُ One of the people who never started their poetry with uh, any tashbib and ghazal is uh, Shanfara in Islamit al Arab. He doesn't. He said, Aqimu bani sudura matiyukum fa inni ila kumi siwakum la amyalu faqad hummati al hajatu wal laylu muqbir. Straight away he starts with a fight. He's angry. His story is, his story is, one day he requested from his sister something. He asked his sister to do something for him. And he said, sister, can you do this for me? She said, I'm not your sister. What do you mean you're not my sister? She said, we don't have the same dad. This doesn't make sense. He went to his mom. He said, mom, what's this that my sister's saying? His mom tried to ignore the answer to the question. He repeated it again. He said, Mom, tell me, what, what, what is my sister saying? Now, now, now it's a bit weird. You're not answering the question, what is it? So she tried to ignore it again. Then he took out his sword and he said, if you don't tell me, I'll cut your head off. She said, listen, okay, I'll tell you. I'll explain it. Basically, the man I'm currently married to killed your dad. He's the man I'm married to right now, waged a war on our people, on your father's people. He killed the men, including your father, and took the women, including myself, as spoils of war. I became his wife and I have children for him and I don't, I don't argue and I, do not, I don't cause fuss. He said, so this man killed my dad, huh? I promise. So he went into the uh, to the forest, ran away from everybody. And he said, I'm gonna kill you all, the whole tribe, Al-Bakri Abi, all of you guys, I'm not gonna let one of you guys get away, I'm gonna kill you all. Some of the narrations mentioned, he said, a hundred of your men, I'm gonna kill you for my father. So this is where he starts his poetry. He doesn't start with women and ghazil and all of that, he doesn't want that. He straight away is making, promising them, get ready. Prepare yourselves, get your horses ready, because it's wartime. It's a time to fight. But other than that, the poets, they start their poetry with bad things. Nabi Allah Muhammad was not one to do that. He didn't, alayhi salatu salam. But that being said, he would say a poetry that was already made. Salawatullahi wa salamun Yani he's the one who said, inna min al bayani la sihra, right? That from the eloquence is magic. 
When a person is eloquent, it's magic, right? The Prophet said that, alayhi salatu salam. And he also said, وَإِنَّ مِنَ الشِّعْرِ حِكْمَةً And in the poetry is a what? Wisdom. Yani, if a person is eloquent in speech, as they say in the English language, this person is so eloquent, they can sell a sand to an Arab. Is that eloquent, right? So eloquence is something else. A person who is eloquent, who is able to speak, to get his point across, is something else, right? Eloquency, some people think it is that you, you use big words. Using big words, big jargons, and people don't understand what you're saying is eloquence. That's, that's what people think, right? Poetry is not like that. Uh, sorry, eloquence is actually being able to structure words in the most summarized way and get it a point across quickly. The Prophet was the most eloquent man. Sah? Alayhi salatu salam. And everybody could understand him. Everybody could what? Could understand him. They say, yani when they talk about balagha, eloquence is balagha, right? I'm a fasaha. They say the condition of fasaha is that the person doesn't use words that are big. And there was a man one day, he's the teacher of Khalil ibn Ahmed al-Farahidi, the teacher of Sibawi, he's his teacher. He's called Isa al nahwi So what he did was one day he was in the market and he fell off his uh, riding beast. And they said that when he spoke, no one understood what he was saying. He, if whatever he said, if he asked you for something, you will never understand what he's saying. It's just big words he uses. So when he fell down, he fell down in a terrible way. All the people, they came around him and they looked at him. And he said to them, what? What did he say, Ibrahim? He said, مَا لَكُمْ تَكَاكَأْتُمْ عَلَيَّا كَتَكَاكِئُكُمْ عَلَى ذِي جِنَّةٍ إِفْرَنْقِعُ عَنِّي A normal Arab would struggle to understand what he just said. So the people, they thought that he was a Jew. He spoke Hebrew and they beat him. They beat him so badly and then he never, from that day onwards, he spoke with simple words. Basically what he said is, Why is it that all of you guys are circulating me like that? The way that you go around a crazy person. Just means leave me alone. All of you guys run away. Leave. So this is not eloquency, like speaking. Speaking like that is not any eloquency. The Prophet was the most eloquent, alayhi salatu salam. So sometimes the Prophet might even ask about a line of poetry. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, al-Imam Muslim narrated in his sahih that al-Sharid ibn Suwayd al-Thaqafi, radiyallahu ta'ala anhu, he said, Radiftu Rasulallah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yawma. One day I was with the Messenger alayhi salatu salam, and the Prophet said to uh, al-Sharik ibn Suwayd al-Thaqafi, the Prophet said to him, alayhi salatu salam, Hal ma'aka min shi'ri umayyata bin abi salt? Umayya ibn Abi Salt, his poetry, do you have any of it? Have you memorized any of the poetries of uh, this poet, Umayya ibn Abi Salt? So, uh, Sharik ibn Suwayd ibn Thaqafi, he said, hey, naam. Yeah, I have memorized some. The Prophet then said, he, he means give it to me. Hey, read it for us. Let's hear it. So he read it. He read it. He said, and shed to Baytan. I only read one line. The Prophet then said to him, He, give us more. And then he said, Thumma and shed to Baytan. And then I read a second line for him. And then the Prophet وسلم, again said, Repeat, يعني, give us more. And then he said, Hatta and shed to I read 200 lines of poetry on the Prophet. And Imam Nawawi, he said, 
أن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم استحسن الشعر أمية. The Prophet liked the poetry of Umayya ibn Abi Salt. So the difference here, brothers, is when Allah he says, وَمَا عَلَّمْنَاهُ الشِّعْرَ وَمَا يَنْبَغِي لَهُ is that the Prophet can, he will never, he can never construct poetry from himself. And he didn't even like it to construct it from himself. But he would love to listen to the poetry that were said. He would want to hear it. عليه, عليه ولذلك, I advise you, brothers, highly encourage you to take time out to memorize poetry. There is a lot of wisdom in poetry. Yani people avoid poetry. Poetry has wisdom. Some information that you sometimes can't recall and you can't remember. You can recall it just in a few lines of poetry, right? If I asked you now, what are the conditions of La ilaha illallah, the prerequisites of La ilaha illallah, you might say to yourself, I have to think. But if you had a, a line of poetry to memorize it in, that's it. العلم واليقين والقبول والانقياد فدر ما أقول والصدق والإخلاص والمحبة وفقك الله لما أحب That's how I remember it. But if you ask me to just go quickly read it and say it, I'll struggle. But I remember it in those lines of poetry. Are we all together, brothers? So I encourage you all to do that with poetry. Information that you needed to recall, you can recall it in poetry. Are we all together? And I always, always do that for my children, my, my little kids. They have to memorize a few lines of poetry. I set them. Love them. I say, you need this one, I want. So five days a week, they have to do the Quran and Hadith and all of that. That allows them to have the weekend. But for them to go out on the weekend, they have to memorize a few poetry, lines of poetry. So they will have the weekend for the five days performance, but to be able to go out on the weekend and go out and have fun, there's a few, of, few lines of poetry they have to memorize. So I condition that for them all the time. Last week, the, the, the poetry that we took was Al-Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah. دعي الأيام تفعل ما تشاء الإمام الشافعي said lines of wisdom and beauty that was in it how to deal with the world that you're in and everything so I encourage your children to do it for them and to do it also for yourself because it has wisdom in it الإمام الشافعي he memorized دواوين الشعري and they said to him شافعي why are you memorizing all of these poetries for he said, لأخدم الفقه So I can serve fiqh. Are we all together? I memorize all of these poetries so I can serve fiqh. Are we all together, brothers? To serve what? Fiqh. So learning poetry, serve fiqh, yes. Your language increases. Your language of the Arabic language, what? It increases. It's not like English poetry. It's different. Also, Hassan ibn Thabit was a poet from the poets of the Prophet And one day the Prophet said to him, Go, speak against the, the mushrikeen and what they are saying about us. Respond to them. Jibreel is with you. Zayd, uh, Hassan, ibn, Hassan ibn Thabit, sorry, he was a poet. But him being a poet, the Prophet said to him, go to Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr knows the Arab tribes. He knows the history and everything. Go to him, so when you speak, you don't get the information wrong. Abu Bakr will teach you. Abu Bakr was one of the most knowledgeable people when it came to Ansab al-Arab. That's another science that many people don't give importance to. Learning about the tribes, and the lineages and all of this information, it has a big effect on Islamic history. It has what? Big effect on Islamic history. I'll give you just one example. Muawiyah ibn Abu Sufyan, when he 
was on his deathbed. Who did he pass over to the leadership to? Who did Muawiyah give it to? Muawiyah passed it over to his son Yazid. Huh? Who was alive at that time? Yeah? Abdullah ibn Umar and others were alive. Big company. And Yazid is not a Sahabi. The question now is why did he do that? A noble companion like Muawiyah radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He must have a wisdom behind it. Read Muqaddimat ibn Khaldun. He'll explain it for you. You'll only understand if you know the Islamic history. If you know the Ansab and how it works. Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan knew, understood that Bani Umayyah, the people he's from, they will not expect, accept anybody else. It will cause a havoc to the Muslims if somebody else comes into power because of a history that outs when Nabi Muhammad when he came, what happened? The Prophet resolved tribal problems. Huh? The Quran and the Sunnah it brought people together, unified the people, brought hand in everyone. Huh? Nabi Muhammad when he died, what did Shaitan do? Shaitan brought back what was there before Islam. The disunity that was there before Islam came, it worked towards re bringing that unearthing those conflicts and those disagreements and that took place at that time so you need to understand those conflicts in order to understand what happened after the prophet's death the issues that occurred in islamic history is very important i encourage you all to look at ilmul ansab as well the second thing that the third thing allah protected nabi muhammad from was he never ever drank alcohol alayhi salatu wasalam and he never committed adultery and fornication. Never. Salawatullahi wa sallam. Allah protected him from it. From it. Alayhi wa sallam. Another thing Allah ta'ala made the Prophet as a person was amana. He was a very trustworthy individual. Very honest and truthful. Alayhi wa sallam. Quraysh recognized that. That he was a mahalu thiqatin nas. That he was... A reliable person, people could entrust him with all of their stuff and give it to him. Alayhi salatu wasalam. Even if they gave it to him privately, they knew it was what? It was safe, there was no worry about it. Walidarika, the Battle of Badr, Abu Jahl in the battlefield. One of the people of Quraysh, they looked at Abu Jahl and they said, Abu Jahl, do you think Muhammad was, is lying? And he said, no. Look what he said after that. He said, he is not one to lie about Allah when he didn't lie about our normal day-to-day -day life conversations. If we trusted him with our person and he never lied to us about day-to-day -day things and the dealings and everything, how is he going to lie Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about Allah Azza wa Jalla? That wasn't the reason why they, Abu Jahl said we fought with him, because he lied, or we f felt he lied. That wasn't the reason. The reason was because of tribal reasons. Are we going to accept Bani Hashim as the leaders? Because if he claims he's a prophet of Allah, he's going to lead us all. No, no, no. That's why. But they knew he was trustworthy. They knew he was honest, alayhi salatu wasalam. And he was truthful in what he said. Even when he climbed the mountain, what did he say to his people? The Prophet climbed the top of the mountain and he called the people, Quraysh. The Prophet, what did he say to, he say, say to them? He said, لو أخبرتكم, If I was to tell you all right now, and Nakhailam bil Wadi that there is in that in that uh, uh, that valley there is horsemen coming to destroy you guys all. If I was to tell you an army is coming to destroy you all, Akuntu Musaddiqi, would you all trust what I have to say? Qalu Naam. They said yes. Ma jarrabna, we have never felt from you. عَلَيْكَ كَذِبًا قَطْ We've never felt, we've, we've never seen you lie. That's what he was to them.
even Abu, even when Abu Sufyan went to Heracle, Azim al Rum, huh? Abu Sufyan, what was the question that he was asked? Hal kuntum tataymunahu bil kadibi? Did you guys ever suspect him to be a liar? Qabla an yaqula ma qala before he said what he said. And before he claimed to be a messenger, have you ever felt from him or seen from him any lies? Abu Sufyan said no. Hirakla then said, فَقَدْ عَرَفْتُ أَنَّهُ لَمْ يَكُنْ لِيَدْعَ الْكَذِبَ عَلَى النَّاسِ وَيَكْذِبَ عَلَى اللَّهِ Exactly the point. He would not avoid lying to you guys and then randomly choose to lie about Allah Azza wa Jalla. That won't work. ولذلك, when people say to you, is this Qur'an the speech of Allah? We say yes. If they say, how do you know it is the speech of Allah? Because I trust Nabi Muhammad. Very important that you understand his sidq. I ask you a question. If somebody is reliable to you, truthful, he doesn't, he's never lied to you, would you believe them? And everybody says he's truthful. And you've felt you've seen him. And you even see the people who hate him, when it comes to him, they will say, no, he's not a liar, but, and they criticize him on other things. Would you ever suspect that person? If he told you something, would you take it from them? To be honest, you do that for a lot of people, right? We actually do it, subhanAllah, sadly enough, the world that we live in on social media and everything, we just take things as it is without even verifying who said it and where it came from, we don't even care. Nah. So the person who came with the message is something we have to study, then we believe what he came with is true from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's how the Prophet was amongst his people. He was truthful. Another quality that the Prophet had before Islam and after Islam was ties of kinship. He kept the ties of kinship. Alayhi salatu wasalam. And this is something, brothers, we're very weak at when it comes to our family members. We abandon our siblings. We, some of us haven't spoken to our family members for a long time. We avoid them. We don't care about them. It's not Islam. And sometimes I get worried. The older generation were unique when it came to ties of kinship. Silatul Allah Arham. Shocking. Hanida, I, when I was young, I, before mobiles came out, I used to see my father get a book, a small book, a little notebook he had. And on there were all these people's name, family members, their names and their numbers. I mean, one of the earliest phones that came out was Sony Ericsson. It was actually called Ericsson first before them and Sony joined. My father, he, everyone's phone was number was written on there. It's called a phone book, right? I remember as a kid, a little kid, I asked him, I said, Dad, what is all of these numbers? What is this all for? He said, I have to call back home people, the family. Back home, they call the people, That's the money, they're everything. When they, my dad told me, when he came to the UK and he landed, whatever was left over from the money he landed on, he went, before he went left or right, anywhere else, that money he had, he went to a money transfer company to transfer it back to his family. So when you look at the older generation, the ties of kinship, qaraba, how they know about their, it worries me the younger generation, right? Even if they're with their siblings, they're not with them, they're on their phone. Some family members, they talk to you more on the phone then face to face, ah. when you're with them face to face, you hardly say anything to each other. But on the what's happened. So if you're a person who's not good with communication and anything like that, just create a family WhatsApp. And every now and then just say, Salaam Alaikum, how are you guys all doing? And inshaAllah ta'ala, that might be a, a way to keep ties of kinship. Allah speaks about the dangers of those who cut the ties of kinship. فَهَلْ عَسَيْتُمْ إِنْ تَوَلَّيْتُمْ أَنْ تُفْسِدُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَتُقَطِّعُوا أَرْحَامَكُمْ 
to cut the ties of kinship. Look, keeping the ties of kinship has not, nothing to do with the people keeping tie, ties, the people keeping relationship with you. If they've chosen to boycott you, it doesn't justify you boycotting them. You still have to find out how they're doing and everything. Of course, you don't have to be friends with everybody. Just find out, are you all right? Is everything good? Especially the immediate family, your, your brothers and sisters, uh, your parents, parents, your children. Those are immediate. You have to make sure that you are aware of their well-being. وَلِذَلِكَ كُفَّارُ قُرَيْشِ The Arab pagans, they, one of the things that they wanted to belittle the Prophet for was you're, you're cutting the ties of kinship. Look what you're doing to us. The message you're coming with is cutting the ties of kinship. It's very dangerous for somebody to do that. To cut the ties of kinship. And he وسلم, was not like that. When the Prophet came back home to his wife Khadija, after he came home, and he just saw Jibreel and he was like, what did I just see? He came back home and he sat in front of his wife Khadija and she said the following words to him. After he informed her of what he saw, she said, Kalla wallah, la yukhzikallahu abada. Allah is never gonna forsake you. Never. Never will he ever forsake you, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? He said, the first thing she said, innaka la tasiru rahim. You keep the ties of kinship. That's number one. وَتَحْمِلُ الْكَلَّ And you also, the word al-kal is that you carry the weight, the burden of the weak. And also, the orphans and the little children, you carry their burden. وَتُكْسِبُ الْمَعْدُومَ وَتَقْرِئُ الضَّيْفَ وَتُعِينُ عَلَى نَوَائِبِ الْحَقِّ So this shows you which is the first point I want to focus on. إِنَّكَ لَتَصِرُ الرَّحِيمُ You keep ties of kinship. You keep ties of kinship. So the Prophet Sallallahu that was his qualities before he became even a Prophet. Yani that was a quality that he had. He used to keep the ties of kinship. Sallallahu Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Also the Prophet Alaihi Salatu Wasallam he used to be one that had in him fear. And he wasn't at a, a position or he wasn't in a state of ease, alayhi salatu wasalam. That's how he was. And when the revelation started for him, that's when he became at a state of ease, alayhi salatu wasalam. Thoughts used to run his mind, alayhi salatu wasalam. He used to think a lot. But that's why he used to leave his people. And he would go away. And he would stay away from them for a long time. Just thinking and pondering and contemplating, alayhi, alayhi salatu wasalam. That's what Allah said in the Quran. وَكَذَلِكَ أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ رُوحًا مِنْ أَمْرِنَا مَا كُنْتَ تَدْرِي مَا الْكِتَابُ وَلَا الْإِيمَانِ وَلَكِنْ جَعَلْنَاهُ نُورًا نَهْدِي بِهِ مَنْ نَشَاءُ مِنْ عِبَادِنَا وَإِنَّكَ لَتَهْدِي إِلَى صِرَاطٍ مُسْتَقِيمٍ the Prophet وسلم, he was not one who had any detailed guidance with him. He had overall general guidance, meaning knowing that there is God and knowing that he is the only one that should be worshipped, that much the Prophet had. He didn't have any detailed guidance. وسلم, but then the revelation came and he gave you life. What's the ayah talking about? Meaning the Prophet was not at a state of ease. So I want to say to people who today say the same thing. I am, Allah, I feel down. I don't feel happy. Fine. The revelation is what your heart needs. Your heart is uh, dehydrating. And it needs, it's calling for the revelation. It's saying, give me the wahi. If you go back to this Quran and you go back to the, the revelation, your heart, will, uh, your heart will find tranquility. And that's why it was a mercy for the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, before uh, anybody else. That's how he saw it. Inshallah ta'ala, I haven't taken a few questions 
the last few uh, days, the last few weeks. So inshallah ta'ala, we'll, I'll take some of your questions, please stick to the topic for the questions, inshallah ta'ala. If you have any questions, put your hand up, inshallah ta'ala. Ayy fadl. The question I was asked was, what happened to the poet who wanted to kill a hundred people? They said, they found him in the desert. Uh, he killed 99 before they caught him. Okay? It's a story, whether it's true or not, Allahu Alam. But he killed 99 and they killed him. When he died, they left his body يعني, in, the, in the sun, يعني, on the floor like that. So one man who was going by his body threw a stone at him saying, يعني, oh you who tried to harm my people and he threw a stone at him. They said that the stone came back and he hit the, this man on his head and he became the hundred person who passed away. So they said he killed a hundred. Ninety-nine while he was alive and one hundred when he died. I mean, there's no chains for it, but he mentioned these stories. Wallahu alam. Any other question? The, con the hadith the Prophet sallallahu mentioned is that the Prophet sallallahu he said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, the word ar-rahim, ar-rahim, Allah said, I extracted it from my name ar-rahman, ar-rahim. Are we all together? فَمَنْ وَصَلَكَ Anyone who keeps the tides of, tides of kinship, Allah said, I will, connect, I, will, I will be connected to them. And anyone who disconnects you, Allah says, I will disconnect you. The dangers of it is what? That you will become disconnected from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's the worst you can, possibly, you can possibly face if you cut the ties off. Any other question? Rafiq, barakallah. Hayya Abdul Samit. So, beautiful question Abdul Samad asked. He said, how is it the case when we find that the Prophet ﷺ himself sometimes saying poetry? So when the Prophet ﷺ, uh, the Sahabas were building the masjid for us, they were carrying the rocks and they were saying, they were saying, in qa'adna wa nabiyu ya'amalu fadaka minna amalu mudallilu. What was that before that? And it was, that was one of the lines. In Qa'adna wa Nabiyu ya'amalu fadaka minna amalu al If we sit down and the Prophet is working, this is going to be a bad deed. Yani, before that, they were saying other things. The scholars, they said, or poets, and those who studied al urud wal Qawafi, which is a subject, the ozan of those statements is, is broken. And the Prophet would deliberately break it so he doesn't become poetry. Do you understand? Poetry has a rhythm. And whatever the Prophet ﷺ says, the wisdom will break for it not to be a big poetry. Or else that means that the Prophet ﷺ, he knew poetry. Allah says, وَمَا عَلَّمْنَاهُ شِعْرَهُ وَمَا يَنْبَغِي لَهُ Does that make sense? I know. So we, when we say poetry, we look at it from two perspectives. The pro one perspective is Arabic literature. That's one or the science of how to structure poetry yani which is known as al-urud and al-qawafi learning how to structure sentences if, you're, if you want to study Arabic literature I would say start with Banat Su'ad Lamiyat al-Arab Maqsurat ibn Durayt those books are good beginner books and uh, after that, you should do the Mu'allaqat uh, al-Asharah and then the Maqamat al-Hariri. Those, oh, those books are very good when it comes to Adab uh, al-Lugha. No. Any other questions? Uh -huh. So, how do you deal with people who you want to keep ties of kinship with but they do not want to do it? Allah tabarak wa ta'ala, he said, فَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ مَا اسْتَطَعْتُ You try your best to keep the ties of kinship. Try to call them. If they've blocked you, and deleted you, and, and there's no means to get to them, 
then you're not, be, you're not going to be blamed. But you have to try. Because keeping ties of kinship is not based on the one who wants you to keep ties of kinship with them. You have to keep it. You, even if they cut you, you what? You connect them. Because this is an obligation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why you're doing it. You're not doing it because, uh, because of them or because you want to be on good pages with them. This, by the way, is only applying to the family. Amen. As for a Muslim, a general Muslim, you don't have to call all the Muslims. Just don't boycott them, but you don't have to call all the Muslims. But the family, you have to connect them, you have to look for them. I haven't heard from Fulan, how, how are they? So another good question, mashallah, that was asked. What about if your family is of a different belief? Yeah, any day you're not Muslims and you're Muslim, for example, even then you have to still keep ties of kinship. Asma binti Abi Bakrin, she said to the Prophet, Inna ummi mushrikatun. My mother is a mushrika. Her mother was a what? A non Muslim. And she wants something from me. Look what she said that after, after Asdul Ummi, shall I keep the ties of kinship with my mother? And the Prophet said, Sidi Ummak. Keep the ties of kinship with your mother. So, of course, you have to. Even if there are what? Non Muslims. You can't boycott your family. Even if you're of different religion. Now, this is a big discussion now. What constitutes family? So, in English, is there a difference between family and relatives? Yeah? What's the difference between a family and a relative? Your cousins fall under relatives. And what about family? Your mom and dad and sisters and all of that. Yeah? So cousins will not be part of the definition of a family? Hmm? Cousins are part of the family. Because the non-Muslims, they don't marry their cousins generally, sah, in the West. That's because they say it's family. They say, you Muslims get married to your cousins. Ha, you marry your own family, that's how they look at it. Okay, what about my, my uncles? Are they part of my family? Maternal and the paternal. But then that's, that's a family. Sah, shara'an that's through the, yani the people, for a woman, the people who don't break her wudu are the family. And there's a khilaf on the cousins. There was a dispute. Some scholars, they add it into it. Some, back in, inshallah ta'ala, the cousins of they fall under the family. You keep the ties kinship. How do we answer the kids when sometimes we tell them we should do so and so? As the Prophet also used to do it, they say yes. It's because it was easy for him, because he had the bad thing removed from his heart. We don't have that. How to tackle this question? This is a good question and a very smart question from a child, mashallah. But the removal of these bad things were to make the Prophet perfect. And no one's telling you to be perfect. Does that make sense? And the bad parts of what was taken from the Prophet ﷺ had now made him perfect. And he has not got the weakness that we have in terms of our religion. Salawatullahi wa salamu I remember I read a benefit one time. When the Prophet ﷺ's father, his son Abu uh, Ibrahim passed away, what happened? Yeah? No, no, what happened to the Prophet? What did the Prophet do? When his son Ibrahim died, he cried, right? So there was a great Imam whose son passed away and they said he didn't cry. The Prophet cried and this great Imam didn't cry. I think it was Sufyan ibn Uyayn or Sufyan al one of the Imams. They told him about the death of his child and he didn't cry. Who's better here? The one who cries or the one who doesn't cry? Huh? The one who cries is better when he's told that he lost his child. Why? Huh? 
because the Prophet cried. Ah. But then uh, here the question is is that the Prophet cried and this great Imam didn't cry. It was either Ibn Taymiyyah I read it from saying this or Dhahab bin Sir Ala bin Ubala. One of the two, don't quote me, but it's one of the two. He talks about it. He says the Prophet is better. But when we look at it, we'll be like, this guy's Iman is solid. Allahumma barik. He didn't cry. And they just told him about the death of his child. It's the Habi or Ibn Taymi, whoever it was, they said, no, the Prophet is better. You know what his explanation was? And when he answered it, it's very profound the answer he gave. Proving that the Prophet is a more complete than the great Iman. Do you guys know what he said? Uh, I'm not going to tell you. You guys have to relook it up yourselves. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you. You guys have to research it and look it up. Your what? Yourselves, inshallah. Ta'ala. Another question. So it's either Dhabi, so it's Sir Ala Minu Bala, or Ibn Taymiyyah is Majmu' al Fatawa. Both of them are a few volumes. So just look in those tons of volumes, inshallah. Ta'ala. Ayyah. Yeah. The poetry of Hassan, al- uh, Hassan ibn Thabit is mentioned, or a lot of it is mentioned by Al Imam al Dhahabi, he mentions a lot of it. The poetry is to defend the Prophet, وسلم, to defend the wives of the Prophet, وسلم, and the honor of the Prophet. It's written. Actually, there's a book that's called Diwan Hassan ibn Thabit, and all of that has the poetry of Hassan ibn Thabit. Any other questions? Uh, Hmm. Uh, yeah, last week I asked the uh, Hassan and Hussein, did they have children? And did they, if, they, if they had children, did their children have children? But Hassan, did anyone research that? Uh, yeah, fadal. I mentioned the answer. Sah, Yeah? Sah. So both of them, their children lived on. I said Hassan, Hassan, some scholars they said otherwise, but like in the, both of them, they had children that lived on. Hassan and Hussein, both of them did. Aye, any other questions? Ah, fadal. I, rem- I know the story you're talking about. Ibn Taymiyyah mentioned in his kitab As-Salib al-Maslul ala Shatim al-Rasul but I don't remember the, the details of the story. But I'm 100% in kitab As-Salib al-Maslul ala Shatim al-Rasul. There was a, there's a, there's a, uh, there's a Abdullah ibn Sarhid who, the same thing, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam at his time, he was reading poetry against the Prophet alayhi wasallam, insulting the Prophet's honor and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam commanded him to be taken uh, even, even if he's holding onto the, the, the corners of the Kaaba. But then Uthman brought him to the Prophet. He brought him to the Prophet and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam gave him bay'ah at the end. But the other ones, including Ikrimah, Ikrimah, he became a Sahabi at the end. The other ones, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he dealt, he dealt with them. Like in Abdullah ibn Sarh, he took Islam. Uh, and the, or the Prophet gave him bay'ah because Uthman brought him. And uh, Ikrimah took Islam. He became a companion. So now, Ibn Taymiyyah has a kitab on this whole issue and talks about it. A person is asking a Shaykh a question. Should they say, Barakallahu feek to the Shaykh and then ask him, if he's a, if he's a Shaykh, but not me, inshallah ta'ala. He's a Shaykh? Yeah, definitely. Have manners in the way you ask the question, the way you, the way you put the question forward. Um, yes, but not me, inshallah. You can ask me the question straight away. Any other questions? Barakallahu feekum, brothers. May Allah bless you. Subhanakallahu alhamdulillah. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Astaghfiruka wa atubu